good day and welcome to the daily chapter reading of It's Your Loss. The book about grief. What's too painful to remember we simply to choose to forget? If you're camped out at Lake Denial, the sheer weight of all the memory waters trying to leak through your emotional tent doors might feel overwhelming, which probably makes you even less inclined to look at them. The longer you ignore them, the greater the weight and the higher the risk when you say, read a letter from the person you lost. It can feel like if you stop racing with all your might, you'll drown in sadness for the rest of time. But the thing I didn't know in my loss and that I want you to know is that feeling those feelings isn't a permanent state. That it's safe to cross the lake to sad town and access that reservoir of feelings from wherever you are now. Drink at the watering pool, dip your toes in it, wallow in its shallow pools, because you won't get sucked under and you won't drown. Behind the roaring waterfalls of sadness is a whole bunch of wonderful memories. I think sometimes we take loss very seriously indeed, because often it is. But in taking it very seriously, we can detach a lot of ceremony and organization to it and become obsessed with finding the correct way of doing things. But memorializing a person or a thing or a moment in time doesn't need to be deadly serious. It can be messy, it can be funny, you don't need to order a floral arrangement and a light candle in its honor. You don't even need to get dress or stand up. All it takes is you in your mind getting together to your knees up. Particularly with death and loss, there can be a sense of propriety and reverence about things that just might not speak to the way you're feeling. So you do you. Whatever you need to keep that memory going, do that. Where Robin needs to be surrounded by people, I need space and a time away from that to let my brain catch up with reality. And if you're somebody who's kept things in the emotional lockbox, you might need the same. That's okay, it's never too late to start on this journey. Sit by yourself, pick up an object, however you reconnect with your memories is completely up to you. There's something about possessions detached to a loss that makes them oh so precious, and lock them up when clumsy friends come over sort of way. Indeed, there are a couple of things in my house that I have no sense of humor about like the unfathomable clay peacock bowl I made my mom in year four that's completely terrifying, but which she cherished, and that was in her hospital room when she died. I tense up when people are around it, and my partner knows that if anything happened to it, there's a high chance he'd find parts of it inserted into parts of him. <clears throat> but, and this is something I'm still learning as I go. It's so important to remember that things are just things. They might help you to access a memory and they might feel wonderful to touch and have around you, but they are not what you lost. This ring is just metal and stone. A favorite teddy is just full fur and stuffing. An award for great work is just brightly covered purse packs. It's you that puts the meaning in them. The memories, the feelings, the thing that makes them special, that's all you. So I say try not to hold on too tightly. Sometimes we get so detached to looking after things that it becomes a kind of mania. We fear for them and losing them feels like a disrespect, like losing the person or thing all over again. And there are some things like letters or handmade items that are precious, but if they're lost, everything detached to them still lives on. So let those things be a part of your life, not objects you have to live your life around. Wear the perfume, put on the ring, read the letters, display the frightening peacock bowl, because everything precious about them is already with you, and that can never be smashed by a careless hand or lost it on the side of the sofa. Then there are anniversaries. If your loss is related to a specific moment in time, these will pop around once a year to try and send you off at the deep end. I used to wonder why I felt so terrible for the entire month of October. With the help of a little therapy, I was able to understand that I was experiencing pre mummiversary blurriness, the state of mind that accompanies the anniversary of a big loss. Maybe you'll be inconsolable for weeks before, maybe it'll take you completely by surprise, I've experienced both. And if you recognize yourself in any of that, here's what I'd suggest. Pop a note in your diary to recur every year. A gentle reminder that this bit is coming up and you might need to be a little nicer to yourself. It doesn't need to say divorce anniversary in three weeks. It could just say book a massage or be kind to yourself month. Whatever reminder you need. Because
because anniversaries can hit hard. There's something about the time of year perhaps that your brain recognizes and remembers being traumatized around and it calls into action all its best coping mechanisms. Only as previously established, those mechanisms won't always work in your favor. And similarly, you might find the anniversary surprisingly easy to get through. when you've been experiencing, expecting much worse. Whatever happens, a little understanding can go a really long way. Making space to feel catatonically sad, having a contingency in case the sadness never comes, with just a little prep those days can loom less large. My top anniversary tip is this. On the actual day, if there is one, and if you're in a position to do it, give yourself the whole day to just be whatever you need. If you're anything like me, you'll want lots of alone time to feel whatever's there. It took me a long time to get to this point, but these days on my mom anniversary, I take the full day, turn off my phone, and isolate from the world. I'll watch her favorite film, It's a Wonderful Life, maybe look through some old photos and remember a time before my mom was sick. I might write some stuff down, I'll definitely cry, and I'll let my head heart for, for the woman I loved so hard and lost. If that sounds overwhelming, you could try starting a bit smaller, maybe add a little structure to the day, like get up, have a bath, go for a walk, journal, and then be prepared to throw that structure out on the day if it's not what your heart wants to do. Anniversaries of great losses are days to follow your instincts and give yourself whatever the heck you need. For Robin, that's often a big cry and a nice distracting roller coaster with friends. For me, it's obviously the opposite. The one day of the year I allow myself to completely indulge. And on that note, if you did go through a loss by yourself, having other people around who it doesn't affect can feel a bit wounding. They might unintentionally say something hurtful or behave in a way you'd rather they didn't. And if you know that you're somebody who guards their emotions fiercely, know also that it's okay to ask them for time alone. To tell them what you need, whether that's to make a big fuss or get the heck out of your hair. And to try to let all the emotions happen if you can. Cry, wail, lay in a heap on the floor because all that emotion's in there already and it's going to find a way to come out, whether that's in authentic sadness or turn in on your self-anxiety. As an introvert, I'm always going to be about nailing down space and time to process things. But if your lost time living is more ambitious and there isn't an exact date, you might feel like you're missing out on that chance to properly focus on it. You could try putting one in the diary any day so you know there's always a moment to process. Or you could try creating a thing or object that memorializes so you know it's there when you need it. I have a scrapbook of little things I collected during the first throws of my career. Wristbands from Fashion Week, snatches of show write-ups, jokes by them colleagues, and I found hilarious.